So now our last workshop is case studies. So what I've done is I've put together 31 cases uh, going through the figures that come from the analyzer, showing you the blood film, uh, showing you how I would comment on the blood film, um, and then giving you the diagnosis. So I'm going to go through these fairly like a full diagnosis of how I would, what parameters I would look at and try and make up my mind what the disorder is. When I do my face-to-face -face workshops, this is a good time for me because I actually do these workshops over two days face-to-face -face, and then I say to the audience, well, I'm going to sit down and have a rest and I'm going to make you, you make all the diagnoses to see what you've learned over the two days. So we'll start now with our first slide. So just keep in mind when you're looking at a blood film, always look at the age, look at the sex of the patient too, um, and if they've got some clinical notes. And actually, if they don't give you clinical notes, I actually have a code which I put into my report at the end, no clinical notes provided. It might just make them feel a bit embarrassed and they might in future think about putting in clinical notes because they're very important when you're making a diagnosis. So this is a female 30 years of age and looking at the parameters from the analyzer. So this is how I go about it. The hemoglobin can go up and down. So I don't take terribly much notice of the hemoglobin. Well, I don't put too much emphasis on it, put it that way. But I do put a lot of emphasis on the mean cell volume and the mean cell hemoglobin. So I can see that these are both very low. Uh, and then I also look at the, well, of course, your MCHC. I'll just say a couple of words on your MCHC. So the range probably for most people is around about 310 to 360 grams per litre. The MCHC, mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration, is your quality control parameter. Now, this patient is very microcytic and hyperchromic. Okay, so these are very low. So your MCHC can will be correspondingly very low, can be less than the normal range. On the, on, on the contrary, because it's the, it's the actual parameter that tells you whether all your red cell parameters are in range, if your MCHC is above 360, that's telling you that there's something wrong with one of your red cell parameters. Probably the two most common, and I'll just try and be a bit quick with this too, the most common would be autoglutination, where you've got red cells which are linked together and going through in groups and registering with your analyzer as being macrocytic. You then have to warm the blood and put it through at 37 degrees and I'd warm it in a 37 degree um, incubator first and put it through the analyzer. That will reduce your MCV and bring your MCHC back to normal. The other thing that can also give you a falsely high MCV, uh, sorry, for falsely high MCHC would be um, a lipemic plasma. So if you've got a lot of lipemic plasma, that will give you a falsely incorrect hematocrit. So you have to do a saline replacement and replace and then put it through the analyzer again and your MCHC should come back to normal. And the other third thing, which is it, is possibly that the patient has got hereditary spherocytosis with a lot of spherocytes, so that the hemoglobin or the, so your MCHC will be raised in, in hereditary spherocytosis as well. So you need to look at the blood film there and then that's okay, you can't correct that, that's fine. So that's just a bit of an emphasis on your MCHC, which maybe I might have told you before in another workshop but this is low, but that's fine because these are low. Okay, so I'm going to look at the film. I start off with easy ones and I more or less put them in groups. So this is a microcytic hyperchromic picture. 
you're looking at a small lymphocyte. The nucleus is seven microns in diameter. So you can see that the red cells are in fact microcytic. They're smaller than that nucleus. Um, and then there's another image here. When I look at the, sorry, this image here, um, there's some pencil cells on this film. Pencil cells, I feel, are a feature that I would see more commonly in a very severe iron deficiency anemia, which I think this is very severe. So pencil cells, and pencil cells are cells where the walls of the, of the actual red cell are parallel, hence the name pencil. So pencil cells, elliptocytes, that's an elliptocyte, as opposed to this being a pencil cell. So my comment is here, this is how I would comment. Um, I would grade um, my microcytes and my hyperchromasia. If anybody wants to know how I grade, um, I'm very happy to send them some training notes that I have. I can email them to them, and which will tell them how I would grade because it will take too long to explain that all on this PowerPoint presentation. But there are the features, and in severe iron deficiency, thrombocytosis is often um, a feature. So that's how I would report this. So I've given you some iron studies. So you can see the iron is very low. Um, ferritin is two. So those are the iron studies on this patient. Uh, and this was a classical case of severe, actually, iron deficiency anemia. So case number two, our second case is a female, 34 years of age, and I've tried to make it very easy for you to, by telling you they're an immigrant in Australia from Greece, and they've got a low hemoglobin, same classical low MCV, MCH. Uh, so basically, and the standard and the CV of the RDW is also pertinent. I'm just going to take you back to the previous slide and just to show you that I don't think I emphasized the, the red cell distribution width. So in severe iron deficiency anemia, the red cell distribution width is usually high uh, and the red cell count is usually not, it's not low, but it's, it's low-ish. So basically iron deficiency is anemia is just losing iron stores. So there's going to be quite a gradation of cells, which are some more iron deficient than others. If we go to our next case, and we look at this patient from Greece, microcytic and hyperchromic, look at the red cell count. It is high, 5.91. So it's raised and look at the red cell distribution width. It's 14.3, which is normal. So basically those figures are telling you that this patient has got a microcytic hyperchromic blood picture uh, with no anisocytosis, no variation in size. So basically a homogeneous population of microcytic hyperchromic red cells. So that tells me that this isn't going to be iron deficiency. This is the blood film and you can see microcytic and hyperchromic, but also if you look carefully, you can see that there's some cells here with basophilic stippling. The stippling represents free globin chains. Um, there's a target cell here. I think there's another cell with basophilic stippling. I can't quite see it. Oh, anyway, that's the best one on the film. It's possibly a bit of basophilic stippling here in this one as well. So target cells, basophilic stippling, a feature of thalassemia. Okay, so this is how I report. This is the hemoglobin EPG result. Uh, so you can see here with the A2, which is raised. So this is going to be a beta thal tray. We also look for hemoglobin H inclusions uh, and they weren't detected. So simply this is a straight out beta thalassemia tray. So just emphasizing now, 
on those two cases, just emphasizing, look at your red cell count, look at your red cell distribution width, um, because one of them is quite anemic with the gradation of cells on the film, and the thalassemia is a homogeneous population, but it's a tray. Remember, this is a tray. Okay, so your next slide is um, an immigrant from Asia. So they're anemic. They've got a high red cell count. Okay, but they're very microcytic and hypochromic. Uh, this is a classical MCHC for those parameters. And the RDW, red cell distribution width, is high. Let's look at the blood film. This is one that's not seen so often. I think this one fools a lot of people. Uh, and it's a sort of disorder where you don't really get beautifully classical targets. Sorry. These are target cells, but they're not textbook target cells. But in this particular disorder, they're never going to be anything much better. There's actually occasional spherocyte, which is a possibility, but it's very microcytic and hypochromic. And remember, lots of target cells, which have an increased surface area compared to volume, will bring down your MCV. Okay, so this has got more target cells than our beta thal tray. We did a supravital stain on this patient. So we looked for hemoglobin H bodies, because actually I most will tell you that's what this is. So this is a hemoglobin H preparation. So we incubate the uh, red cells in a glass tube with a supravital stain, which is we've used here, Crestle Blue. Uh, and we incubate at 37 degrees for two hours, and then we spread the blood film and we look for these hemoglobin H bodies. So now hemoglobin H bodies are actually, um, they're beta chain tetramers. So in hemoglobin H disease, there's, there's no alpha chains. So that's what you're looking at. And that's, if you had to do that in a hurry and you didn't have time to do a hemoglobin EPG, um, that's how you would do it. But you should do the EPG following that. So the um, way of commenting, was this is the way I would comment with moderate target cells. And this was a case of hemoglobin H disease. Okay. But just remember that those bodies in the red cells with the crystal blue stain are beta chain tetramers. So there's no alpha chains. So now, the next case, which is case four, is a patient who's a heavy drinker. That's <laughs> um, not hard to pick, is it? So they're macrocytic. The MCV is still within range, but I would think you'd see macrocytes on that blood film. Uh, I know the platelet count is very low. So alcoholic liver disease is characterized by thrombocytopenia. Um, Basically, they're lacking thrombopoietin, so they're not producing platelets. And I would be looking also at the, um, the chemistry results. I might show you that in a minute. So this is the blood film. So quite a number of target cells as well. So remember that MCV was still under 100 femtoliters. But you've got a lot of target cells, so because of their surf increased surface area compared to volume, that's actually bringing down that MCV. So you can see the macrocytes as well on the film, so you've got a combination. Target cells around macrocytes, we all learn this off by heart when we start morphology equals liver disease. That's my comment. This is the liver function test, so in many uh, cases you might want to go over and look at the chemistry results. I would always advise that. It's just easy to click over and see what the chemistry results. And this is a, the liver disease um, or the liver function test. This is the GGT and this is raised, classically raised in alcoholic liver disease.
Okay, so a night, an 18 month old child, doesn't really matter what sex they are when they're so little, to be truthful. <laughs> um, and the history was bloody diarrhea. So his hemoglobin is a bit low. Um, these results are okay for his age. All right. But his platelet count's 27. So really, this is a medical emergency. I call this a medical emergency. So this is his blood film. And he's got a lot of schistocytes on his film. Remember, these are not called fragments. These are schistocytes. Uh, these are cells which the, the terminology or the nomenclature used comes from the Greek word ski, S-K-I-S-S, which means to rip. So these cells are ripped um, as they pass through damaged, damaged glomeruli. Um, and the platelets are also adhering to the irregularities in the glomeruli, so they're actually falling as well. So you've got thrombocytopenia and schistocytes. I'm sure you all know that that is hemolytic uremic syndrome. This is how I comment. It is a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. Just to refresh your memory, micro meaning small, angiovessel, pathic disease, so narrowed glomeruli in the kidney, giving you rise to um, a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. Then I'd look at my chemistry. I'd like to know what the urea and creatinine were. These are the markers of renal function, and they're both raised. And that's my diagnosis. And uh, I would treat this as being urgent, and I would ring and tell somebody looking after the patient that that's what you've seen. To diagnose the difference between hemolytic uremic syndrome and the other disorder, which looks identical, TTP, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, you cannot differentiate from the blood film. They look the same. Uh, still important to let them know, let the clinician know. The clinician will be aware that with TTP, those patients have got neurological changes. So they may have severe headaches, maybe going in and out of consciousness. So the only way that the doctor can pick the difference will be looking at the neurological changes displayed by the patient. Okay, so your next page, next case, which is case number six. This is a female who, um, and you've been astute because you've written down in the patient notes that perhaps two years ago, this patient had a mitral valve replacement. And you've got that history there for you. But anyway, if you didn't, um, hemoglobin is low. This is all okay, okay. Interestingly enough, um, well, that doesn't help you that much in this particular this, the RDW and your red cell count really the helpful ones in the fowls and the iron deficiency. But that's just a variation in size. And the platelet count's normal. Okay. So let's have a look at that film. I know that she had a vital valve replacement, but if you didn't have that history, you'd be looking at this case and you'd be looking at these cells. You can see lots of normal cells but there are schistocytes on this film. The two which are probably most classic, well, they're not all. Some of them are a little bit more knocked around, less knocked around than others, but here this has been sheared off. This is a schistocyte. It's a schistocyte here, classical schistocytes. You do not call these fragments. You must call these schistocytes. That's the ICSH nomenclature document, which everybody has got. If anybody looking at these cases or this these um, workshops, you must ask me to email you the ICSH nomenclature um, class, uh, the, the ICSH standardization and grading of nomenclature. I could do that for anybody who would like that. So these are schistocytes. Now. I want to just emphasize for you, uh, 
I should have put this in a really underline it, but the platelet count was normal. So these cells are going, these red cells are going through perhaps a damaged valve where at the force of the flow in the heart, they're going through this damaged valve and actually being sheared off as they've gone through this damaged area. But the platelets, which are much smaller, just go straight through. So the platelet count is normal. It's the only disorder where platelet, in a, it's the only microangiopathic hemolytic anemia where the platelet count will be normal in a valve hemolysis or mechanical hemolysis. Sometimes described as mechanical, but the most common is a heart valve. Okay, so this I've flagged this a bit for you here. This patient's a 22-year-old female. I'm wondering whether they had gallstones. And looking at everything here, um, there's really not much except that I would have perhaps thought that the person who was filing these results should look at this MCHC, which is telling you that it's above the normal range. So it does tell you that one of the parameters is probably not normal. So I now know that you're all very switched on and I explained to you that the only disorder where, where you could correct this MCHC, would, where you could not correct it, would be somebody who had hereditary spherocytosis. And here's a really nice blood film of hereditary spherocytosis. These are the spherocytes, which are completely round, no area of central pallor. And because you can see they're a little bit anemic, um, so you can see and expect to find an increase in polychromasia or reticulocytes. So basically, if I had a new film and I didn't know, I didn't even have a hint, query gallstones, um, I would, and somebody would, Often they get, I get asked to look at the film. Do you think there are spherocytes on this film? And I say, well, look, yes, there are. But you know what you need to do? You should add a reticulocyte count to see what the reticulocyte result is, because it'll be roughly between three to the three point five percent reticulocytes, and that's always my answer. And then, of course, you take the blood to the blood transfusion department because there could be two possible diagnoses. It could be hereditary spherocytosis or it could be an autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Probably not autoimmune hemolytic anemia because um, I'm going to show you a case coming up, I think, which has got nucleated red cells circulating. Usually you do not see circulating red cells in hereditary spherocytosis. So these are the reticulocytes. This is my comment. This is my reticulocyte count, which is 4.2, and you have, or should always give an absolute reticulocyte count as well. So you can see it's raised. Um, I did take the blood to the blood bank and get them to do a direct antiglobulin test. In this case, it was negative. If it was positive, I would think that maybe this was a, uh, an autoimmune hemolytic anemia but it's negative. So that's telling me that this is basically um, hereditary spherocytosis. Um, okay, sorry. Next slide. Yep, that's the answer. So the next slide is a 46 year old female as you can see, I'm doing this in groups, jaundice for investigation, very low hemoglobin. These are all okay. Um, this is a little bit high. So I need to look at this film fairly quickly as well. Now, as I said, I'm giving them to you in groups. This patient's also anemic. I'm not too sure why the patient with HS was anemic, but that doesn't matter. You can see the spherocytes here lots of spherocytes, lots of polychromasia. So the retic count's going to be quite high on this patient. See the everywhere. 
and there's a nucleated red cell. So when I move around, I see lots of nucleated red cells as well. So this basically tells me with my experience that this is an autoimmune hemolytic anemia. That's my report. And there were 53 nucleated red cells per 100 white cells. You would not see that on somebody with hereditary spherocytosis. The retic count was 8.1%. It's a very high absolute count. And I took this blood to the blood transfusion area and they did a direct antiglobulin test and it was positive. So it actually was an IgG, a warm antibody coating the red cells. That's really important for the clinician looking after this patient to be aware of this. And so I have an autoimmune hemolytic anemia just to show you the differentiation between the two. I'm now going to show you another slide uh, with somebody who's got necrotizing fasciitis. This is a 56 year old female. Uh, this is the hemoglobin is low. Um, the RDW is raised. Okay, so I need to look at this fairly quickly as well. So this is a pretty rare disorder, but we in hematology can make a diagnosis of this before microbiology can make a diagnosis. Uh, we can at least give the doctor a, kin a fairly good estimation of what's going on. So this patient has got, I've tried to show you an absolute neutrophilia and the neutrophils look very toxic so there's an increase in the primary granules here. Um, so this looks like as they've probably got septicemia and a lot of spherocytes. Now that's what you get when you've got necrotizing enterocolitis. They actually ordered a urinary hemosiderin, which was positive. This is an amazing positive result. So that just basically shows that this patient has got intravascular hemolysis. Here's my comments. And I did, a, we, we ordered, or we, maybe they ordered one as well, I don't know, but a reticular site count was done. It's interesting, isn't it, to have such a low hemoglobin 75 with practically not many retics. So what was happening is that this patient, so they've, well, I'll just finish showing you all of this. So that's the absolute retic count. Um, I looked at the chemistry results. So they had a, the, um, LD, the LDH was very, very high. So this is an indication lactose, um, dehydrogenase is showing it had a very high LDH, so actually actively hemolyzing. Um, I'll just skip these results. So they're hemolyzing. So basically this patient had clostridium perforogens infection. So the sugar toxin produced by this clostridium is actually destroying the red cells and so fast that the reticulocyte count didn't have time to catch up and start to produce more red cells. So that's why the reticulocyte count was, was basically normal, but so low compared for the hemoglobin of the patient. Okay, so we go to our next case. This was a, an eight-year-old child who, um, had been in a house fire, it was a winter's in the winter and had been in a house fire quite close to the hospital. Um, the interesting thing is that this isn't related to the house fire. This is a low MCV and a high red cell count. So I thought that this patient might have even had thalassemia, but that wasn't uh, it wasn't really that important to make a, a diagnosis there. When we look at the film, um, they had suffered severe burns and that's why the platelet count 
was I've got no result for the platelet count. So let me show you the film. This is probably the most dramatic film I've ever seen. So what's happening here, this is third degree burns and the heat is destroying the spectrum in the red cell membrane. So the contents of the red cells are leaking out. So the contents of these red cells, you can see these little tiny bits and pieces of red cells, which have leaked out of the destroyed spectrum. And of course, these little bits and pieces of red cells are counting as platelets. So you obviously are not going to issue a platelet count. And to be honest, the patient, the doctor knows exactly what's wrong with this patient. They've had third degree burns. They've come to the nearest hospital. And then in Sydney, Australia, they're not kept at the hospital where I work. They're sent to a particular hospital, which is specific, specifies and concentrates in severe burns. Yeah, so severe burns, and I haven't actually got a I don't ever get to follow up, but yeah. So I guess you can call these cells microspherocytes. Some of these cells, which are spherocytes, are probably a little bit smaller. I don't think it's necessary to describe cells which are microspherocytes. A spherocyte is a spherocyte. And hard to know how to describe these cells. I've just called them marked red cell budding. And this was third degree burns and our questions possible a beta thal or iron deficiency, but I've thought that they probably probably had a beta thal tray as well. Okay, so now our next slide is a one day old neonate. And remember the neonates the first four weeks of life and practically and diagnosis without looking at the film because they gave us a beautiful history saying jaundice in the first 24 hours of birth. Um, the touch, hemoglobin touch low, lowish on the lowish side. Um, the MCV is, it's okay, I guess. Yeah, the MCV is okay. This is the normal range. Um, so not much more that I can see from this, looking at these figures. But I'm looking now at the blood film. This is a hundred magnification, uh, a thousand magnification spherocytes again. So I'm putting them in groups, as I said, this is another disorder where you see spherocytes as a feature, one day old neonate. All right, so I think from your long talk on paediatrics, you should all know that uh, this is how I'm going to report it. It's a neonate, so it's fine to see up to 24, 25, something like that, nucleated red cells per 100 white cells. And I'm going to take this blood to find out what's going on with the, mother, with the baby. So I'm going to take it to the blood bank, and they're going to tell me that the mother is group O in this case. So she's got circulating anti-A and anti-B, and the neonate is group A. Uh, I'm not going to bother to do a direct anticoagulant test because what's happening here is that the mother's anti-A has coated the baby's A red cells. And the number of, it's, it's, it's a very weak reaction, so it's not really necessary to do a direct anticoagulant test, but if I did, um, I would have been weakly positive. Uh, so it's an ABO hemolytic disease of the newborn. Now, I just must say at this point in time, and you'll record in my pediatric talk, I talked about that baby who was born to the two cousins, first cousins who both had hereditary spherocytosis. The blood film looked a little bit different. Uh, it was a lot and a lot of spherocytes present. So you probably need to just keep that in the back of your mind that the um, differential diagnosis could possibly be um, HS. So now another one day old, extreme jaundice. Hemoglobin's 120. That's pretty low for a newborn baby. Uh, the red cell count, let's not worry about that. The MCV is very high. 
Okay, that's very high. Now, that'd be the sort of red uh, MCV that you might find in a very, very premature baby or in somebody who's got, and I'm sure you all know, who's got a, an RH incompatibility. So the other figures are okay. This is the blood film. So there's a lot of nucleated red cells circulating. There's a lot of polychromasia. Retic count is very high. This is how I've commented. The retic count was four, three, two nucleated, sorry, the nucleated red cells for four, three, two nucleated red cells per 100 white cells. So really very high. And the DAT was strongly positive. So the difference between these two, the ABO and the RH, is the ABO, you've just got a warm antibody um, an anti-A coating the red cells, just gently coating the red cells and giving you an increase in the number of spherocytes. Here, you've got an RH incompatibility, absolutely dive bombing those red cells and causing a severe hem hemolysis. Uh, and so this stat is going to be strongly positive. So there's your answer for that one. And as I said to you earlier, that slide like that, if you ever get one, is really good to demonstrate and teach the maturation of normal red cells, because you get all stages of maturation. Now, again, we have a one day old neonate, and this baby's got a high belly Reuben. Um, hemoglobin's a little bit, well, it's down, hemoglobin's down. What else can I see on this film, on these figures? I really can't see anything else that's giving me a clue that this baby, except, sorry, should have said, that's not true what I'm saying. Uh, it's a one day old, so the range for the MCV is 101 to 117. So this has got an MCV of 84.6. So either this is not a newborn and they've given me the wrong blood. They've given me the mother's blood and not the baby's blood. Or this is a true result. Now the two possibilities, the possibility that I have to find out was from the person running our blood transfusion organization is, was this baby um, transfused in utero? Did it have some sort of hemolysis? And if it was transfused in utero, <clears throat> it was being transfused with normal red cells. So that's something to be aware of. This baby wasn't. This baby's got something else wrong with it. But that is a possibility when you see the normal MCV on a one-day-old baby. You need to check and see if that baby had a transfusion or one or two transfusions. So this is a blood film. And I possibly could show you a much more significant blood film than this, but unfortunately, I'm not going to replace it. This is a case of somebody, a newborn baby that's got hereditary pyropoikilocytosis. So if you think about hereditary pyropoikilocytosis, pyro meaning fire or heat, um, the spectrum is being destroyed even at 37 degrees and so some of the contents of the red cells are leaking out and that's where you get these cells that they look a bit like schistocytes um, i'm not too sure what you want to call them but they're certainly fragments they're certainly red cell fragments for sure so this baby has gone oh sorry just show you the Chemistry results, so these are the chemistry results, very high. And they've got hereditary pyropoikilocytosis. So that even at 37 degrees can destroy the spectrum with that disorder. So that disorder is the same disorder that hereditary elliptocytosis has, whereby the red cells lack spectrum and protein 4.1. So an interesting thing, and I can't show you now, but I have, I have a blood film of that particular patient at 18 months of age. And that little baby now has moderate numbers of elliptocytes on the blood film. 
So it's something that wanes and just dissipates, nothing to really worry about. No definitive tests have to be done to prove it. Um, often it could be a family history. So be worthwhile putting into the computer because if somebody else in the family was born that had the same disorder would be helpful. Yeah, so that's hereditary pyroportocytosis, quite fairly rare. So now we've got a two weeks old baby or two weeks old neonate returned to hospital. So the baby went home very healthy, all about all the parameters normal and returned to the hospital two weeks later with an unexpected anemia. So the hemoglobin was quite low, um, everything else, everything else was normal. Just a very low hemoglobin. Okay, so this is where you've got to look very carefully. So I'm hoping you're all saying to yourself, yes, this is oxidant hemolysis. So I can see some red cells here. For example, this is a bite cell where Heinz bodies have actually been removed by the spleen as these as these red cells are passed through the spleen. So let me just explain this briefly to you. So there are bite cells and blister cells. There's the two really beautiful blister cells down here. So I'm sure you all know this is oxidant hemolysis. So what's happening is that this baby has been subjected to an oxidant. And let's say the most common oxidant they're subjected to at this age group is um, napsaline. In Australia, we have a habit of putting uh, mothballs into wardrobes to stop moths, moths eating holes in clothes, but it's made of napsaline and it's an oxidant. So the oxidant basically transforms the iron in the red cell from the ferris to the ferric state, the two plus to the three plus state and produces a Heinz body. You can't see Heinz bodies on the red, in the red cell on the blood film, only if you use a super vital stain. So these Heinz bodies, are when the red cell passes through the spleen, knowing the spleen's a bit like the rubbish bin in the body, it pits out these bodies, Heinz bodies from the red cell. So you get bite cells where you get this sort of looking appearance. If the red cell membrane then well, the Heinz body is pitted out, but also some of the red cell content gets pitted out as well. So in some cases, the red cell membrane joins back up. And you've got a good example of this blister cell in the red cell workshop. So these are the blister cells. So bite cells and blister cells equal oxidant hemolysis. I put this slide in to show you that this was not a baby, but this was an adult who was actually on Dapsone, which is an oxidant drug. They're on Dapsone because their platelet count was just, they had to try and get the platelet count up. It was very low. They had, they had, um, oh, I'm just trying to think what they had. They had a disorder where they had um, a very low platelet count. So anyway, the doctor, the surgeon actually took out their spleen to try and get the platelet count to come up and it still didn't come up. So I'll tell you the story because it's interesting. So one day when we were in the laboratory and the people were making the blood film on this patient, uh, they said her, pay, her blood looks brown. And I said, oh, I don't think the red cells could look brown. <laughs> so I went and had a look and it was true. It looked really brown. And um, so I said, well, why don't we do a super vital stain on her blood and see if we can see anything in the red cells. And sure enough, uh, we saw all these Heinz bodies. And um, she was being she was being poisoned almost with Dapsone to try and get her plate account coming coming up. Her plate account was less than 10 when the surgeon removed her spleen to get it to come up. So anyway, that's a story about what Heinz bodies look like. Uh, and that's a really nice example of oxidant hemolysis.
When it's a baby, we usually say exposure to an oxidant because the baby's not actually taking a drug as this adult was taking with the hands bodies. They were on Dapso. This is this is an oxidant, but they're not actually taking the drug. So I have a habit of being a bit pedantic and saying query exposure to an oxidant. And you might well want to do a G6PD screen because if you're G6PD deficient, you'll get massive oxidant hemolysis. But this baby was normal. Napsaline induced. So now we're going to some adults. And this is a 60 year old male who had a splenomegaly for investigation. And the results are, okay, this is a little bit low for a male. That's why I say you should look at the sex of the patient and put it all into context. Um, and the plate account was 100, so it was a bit low. And so I know you can all do make this diagnosis because what we're looking at is we're looking at um, a metamylocyte. We're looking at a blast cell, probably a myeloblast, a nucleated red cell, and we're looking at teardrop poikilocytes. All diagnostic put together, teardrop, a leukoerythroblastic blood picture with teardrop poikilocytes equals myelofibrosis. I put this in to show you the drafine on this patient. Uh, and it's quite good in that it just shows you the bony trabecular here, but all of these cells are actually fibrous tissue. So it's just full of fibrous tissue. Uh, this is a stain. This is a reticulin stain, which is a silver stain showing you the degree of fibrous tissue. That's why these patients often have a dry tap when they're having a bone marrow aspirate taken. Maybe they then have to do a trefine roll. Uh, anyway, this is the report. I think you should put when you see teardrop poikilocytes with leukoerythroblastic, you're looking at somebody who's, you should actually actually put that comment in after all your changes, leukoerythroblastic blood picture. So it was primary, primary fibrosis, myelofibrosis, and we did the JAK2, uh, which was positive. So now I'm giving you a few patients with slightly similar disorders. So this was a 55 year old male. He had a, a high hemoglobin and um, his hemoglobin was 189, which is a bit of a worry. Uh, red cell count obviously similarly high. He was microcytic and hypochromic. So perhaps you need to consider why that is the case when you're looking at these initial figures. And everything else is, his white cell count was a bit high. His plate count was also a little bit high. So here's the blood film. This might be a bit tricky for you. It's a little bit hard. I'm taking this picture, this image, right towards just below the tail where the red cells are lying side by side. You can see they're overlapping, hence that very high hemoglobin. Uh, you can see I'm trying to show you a demonstration of um, the fact that they had an absolute neutrophilia. And there's some platelets peeping through. <laughs> difficult sometimes to see the platelet count and estimated platelet count when you've got such a high red cell count, but there are large platelets. Okay. Now I just put this in for interest. This is the trefine. They've got a lot of megakaryocytes. These are megakaryocytes, which are increased. Some of them are a little bit abnormal. That's a bit hypolobulated. Um, it's a bit hypolobulated. So this is my comment. So it's microcytic and hypochromic. So I'm pretty sure you've all realized now that um, this patient's got myelofibrosis. Okay. 
and they can sometimes get GIT bleeding. And that's why they were microcytic and hypochromic. Sorry, I've given you some wrong information. I'm sure you'll forgive me. The last picture was a one, the last image was myelofibrosis. This is polycythemia vera. So nevertheless, this is a low, just show you again, this is a low MCV and MCH due to um, GIT bleeding, gastrointestinal bleeding. They do get large platelets, so it's a myeloproliferative disorder with an absolute neutrophilia. So this is my pro polycythemia vera, JAK2 positive. Okay, so another patient in a similar vein, 58 year old male, he's just having a routine blood count. Um, he's a male with hemoglobin 110, that's not very good. So I register that. He's also a bit microcytic and hypochromic. And his plate account, look at his plate accounts, 908. So I'm sure you know, this patient's got ET, central thrombocythemia. I want you to look at the platelets because there are some platelets and more or less roughly this is normal size, like something like that maybe, normal size platelets. But he's got large platelets. These are large platelets uh, and giant platelets. And this is actually a classical feature of essential thrombocythemia. Remember that large platelets are smaller than the red cell, giant platelets are larger than the red cell. And another parameter that you might like to look at which I don't think I showed you in this case, but you might like to look at your mean platelet volume, MPV. That will give you an indication of the variation in the size of the platelets. It's more or less like the RDW, but platelet for parameter. Also, this patient has a lot of megakaryocytes in the bone marrow. I think this is the trephine, obviously. Large and giant platelets. Remember, it's got to be a salient feature. I think some people over comment on large platelets because they see one or two large platelets and then report large platelets. I'd look at your MPV and see if you think it's really a salient feature worth reporting. Don't over report. Essential thrombocythemia and again, JAK2 positive with gastrointestinal bleeding. So this is a little six-year-old child who had juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And sadly, that's pretty awful for a six-year-old. His hemoglobin is quite low. Uh, everything else, I see his plate account is very high and his ESR is very raised. That's very significant in a, a six-year-old child. And I'm just giving you this case to contrast the difference between large and giant platelets, which is a feature of a myeloproliferative disorder, and a case with a thrombocytosis, but where the platelets are all the same size. So basically, he's got rheumatoid arthritis, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. He's got an inflammatory condition, and he's got a high platelet count as a rear is basically a reactive um, thrombocytosis. So be careful, there is quite a difference between a thrombocytosis in someone with a myeloproliferative disorder and somebody with um, some sort of inflammation where the platelets are all the same size. So it's reactive thrombocytosis. Here we've got a nine-year-old with fever and lymphadenopathy. Um, so they're nine, so I'm happy with those 
ranges for the red cells. We would report these red cells as being normal for age. We don't actually say that it's microcytic and hypochromic because they're not iron deficient. That's normal for age. Their white cell count is high. It's probably all I can really see, but I've got a history of fever, lymphadenopathy. And now I'm showing you the PS resistance of a reactive lymphocyte. This is a reactive lymphocyte with a pleomorphic shape, sort of nucleus and flowing basophilic cytoplasm, often a bit condensed towards the, on the outside. Um, so the, the, the red cell, the cytoplasm ratio is, the, cyt the cytoplasm is condensed, sorry. Um, okay, so we'll look around to see lots more of these. I'm sure you know that these are reactive, red cells normal for age, and I'm going to do a monospot test. The test that we use here is a Clearview IM2 test, and it was positive. So he's got infectious mononucleosis. Now going back to some adults, the 53-year-old male who's got a lymphadenopathy and a split amygdala for investigation. He's anemic. Uh, his white cell count is very high and his platelet count is very low. So it's got something bad going on. Now I hope you're saying to yourself and making your diagnosis quietly to yourself that this, although these cells have got a high NC ratio, the chromatin pattern is actually very mature. These are not blast cells. These are, these are mature cells. So this is not a leukemia. This is a lymphoma. There were 82% lymphoma cells on this blood film. These are the immunophenotyping. We know it's not CLL because it's CD5 negative. But anyway, this film turned out to be a follicular lymphoma with bone marrow involvement. Our next patient is a male and he's 74 years of age. His hemoglobin's on the lower limit of normal. White cell count is quite high and his platelet count is low. I'm sure you all know exactly what this is. These are mature, normal looking lymphocytes. I'd be happy if my lymphocytes look like any of these. So my comment was only just a bit of an isocytosis, but he had 100% lymphocytes. He had a massive lymphocytosis. Uh, his ab absolute count was 93.8 lymphocytes. And he was CD5 positive. So he's got CLL, SLL, okay? So there's the flow diagnosis. So four weeks old baby. The history on the request form said bronchiolitis. That in my hospital makes me think very carefully about a particular disorder. They always put bronchiolitis. Anyway, so looking at this now, I can see the white cell counts increased, 16.2, platelets are okay. Everything else is okay.
but it's not easy. Look at that film. The very young child. Children don't get chronic lymphocytic leukemia. They don't get these sort of things. You're not going to see lymphoma cells in somebody's peripheral blood at four weeks of age. But look at these lymphocytes. They've got cleaved nuclei. Okay, cleaved nuclei. So there is a, a comment which we do have in New South Wales Health Pathology, which had the code for it. And it says, many of the lymphocytes have cleaved nuclei, a feature seen in border telepertussis. Okay. This, page, this baby had 76% lymphocytes with an absolute count of 12.4. So that's just going back to show you that. As I said to you, can't actually, I can't tell you how many you should see, but you see it's an absolute lymphocytosis and you go from field to field looking to see how many of these cleaved lymphocytes you see. And if you think it's significant, then you mention it and you pick up the phone and you ring up the consultant looking after that child because that child, that little baby could be coughing, aerosols going all over the ward. So they need to be isolated to stop the spread of that. Border telepertussis. This is a four-year-old child who's pale, anemic, with a petechial rash. So they've got these little red spots over their skin, which is an uh, indication that they've got a low platelet count. And yes, their platelet count is 78. The white cell count is very high, 25. Um, these, range, these red cells are normal for age, but that's about all that's normal with this baby, or four-year-old, pardon me. So this is probably a little bit hard because I think I haven't shown you a film with such huge big blasts, aren't they? Lymphoblasts. They've got high NC ratio, very fine chromatin pattern, inconspicuous nucleoli, uh, and these are lymphoblasts. So they've got acute lymphoblastic leukemia. That's how I comment on their red cells. And they actually had 82% blast cells. So they had a precursor B, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. I just popped this in for fun. Not for fun, really. For education, the T cell ALL with a CNS relapse. So these are T cells. See how vacuolated they are. See that classic. Um, and the nucleoli are really, really obvious in this. So this is, uh, I'm not, yeah, this is a relapse. Very, very sad. Okay, so 74 year old male with a splenomegaly. What do I notice about this? A bit of a low hemoglobin. Maybe a little bit iron deficient, I don't know. I might query that with a high white cell count. So this is where it gets a little bit harder. This is where we need to have our flow to give us an idea. But can you see that these cells have got, especially these two here, this one here and this one here, have got a slightly the nucleus is slightly towards one pole, and then you've got these villi coming out. So 
So basically, sorry, what we're looking at here. Have any of you been able to tell me this is a splenic marginal zone lymphoma? Because we said initially that they had a splenomegaly. You can see that. Anyway, that's a classical splenic marginal zone lymphoma. And there were 23% of these villous lymphocytes present. It's not CLL because this is a negative. They're the markers for splenic marginal zone lymphoma. There's your answer. So female, 58 years of age, who's fatigued and got a splenomegaly as well. How can I look at this now? 85 white cell, 85.2 white cell count and a slight thrombocytopenia. Everything else looks okay to me. So there you are. This is different from your marginal zone lymphoma. You can see these villi coming around, coming out completely around 360 degrees around the cytoplasm, from the cytoplasm. So this is a hairy cell leukemia. Now, this is a case when I said to you earlier on that I was going to show this to the registrars. This is a classical trephine of somebody with hairy cell leukemia. If you haven't seen any one like this, just register um, how classical it looks and nothing else looks like this. No other disorder. Basically included it for the registrars. Okay, so just going back to the blood film. Okay, hairy cells. So this is a hairy cell leukemia. It was a variant because the white cell count was a bit high. Okay. So now, we put a lot of paediatrics in because we get a lot of paediatrics where I work. But we have amazing set of paediatric children. So this was a little child that had neuroblastoma and it was being treated. Um, so it's on chemotherapy, probably being given methotrexate just for a guess. So the hemoglobin's low, that's okay. This is all right for age. Red cells are normal for age. Uh, the white cell count is high and the platelet count is low. So that platelet count is low because this child is having chemotherapy. So I'm not worried about that. This is low because they're on chemotherapy as well. But the white cell count is raised. So I'm wondering what's going on. Now, if the doctors were doing the right thing and put a history on the request form, that would be very helpful. Uh, if they don't do that, um, I might like to look at the, re the accumulative results on this child because I know they're on chemotherapy and I'd like to see what the previous um, white cell count was. Was it high like that or was it sort of much lower? So looking back, I could see that it was just for example, I see the white cell count was 0.5, then going up to 5, then going up to, where are we? Yeah, then going up to 50, and now today it's 62, okay? So that tells me that that patient is, being, is on chemo um, and that the white cell count's really gone up very quickly, and I suspect that this patient's been on a cytokine namely GCSF, granulocyte colony stimulating factor. So in fact, that is the case. Sorry. That is the case that they're on GCSF, but they haven't told me that. So I would put onto this looking cumulatively back, I would say query on GCSF therapy. Now, this is a big lesson for you. Do not call these toxic. This patient hasn't got toxic. They're not septic. 
there on GCSF, which actually promotes the um, or initiates the production of increased numbers of primary granules in the neutrophils. So that's why, again, the ICSH says do not use the word toxic granulation that implies a bacterial infection because there are other disorders which can give you um, a classical increase in the primary granules uh, and also a left shift. All right, so there's a myelocyte here. It's probably another myelocyte there. So you report this as being on this in this case. Um, consistent with GCSF. If I didn't know, I'd put query on GSF therapy and I would report these red cells as being hypergranulated. Interesting enough, I was concentrating on the, yeah, I didn't report how I would report the white cells. So definitely put a note or make a note for yourself that you report these white cells as being um, hypergranulated neutrophils and then query on GCSF, which they were. So now we're just looking at a couple of children. This one and this one, the previous one and this one, which is three-year-old, who's got a high fever, had this high fever for seven days and has been unresponsive to antibiotics. So looking at all of this, I can see this is okay for age. Uh, the platelet count is raised and the ESR is also raised. Now, I don't know how many of you can remember this particular picture. This is the blood film. I can see the ESR is raised, although I'd be checking the ESR on times 10 magnification. This is a thousand magnification. Um, I can see there's increased granulation in the cytoplasm of these neutrophils. And uh, I can see cytoplasm. Swelling. So I had a history where they were disorder. I think I may have sent you or I may not have sent you a, um, a case study of Kawasaki disease. Again, if anybody looking at this, wherever you be in Australia and you need a case study of Kawasaki, you just please email me and it will be to you in a day or two in the email. So what you get when patients who've got Kawasaki disease, you get moderate hypergranulated neutrophils here. There's some baculation and the rouleau is usually increased. And you get this classic feature, which is that you've got a code for this in New South Wales Health Codes. Neutrophils show cytoplasmic swelling, a feature seen in Kawasaki disease. And again, you pick up the phone and notify the doctor. Uh, I would always look at the um, response that I get in micros, that they don't grow any bacteria. Uh, so looking at that now, what you need to be aware of is that you cannot diagnose Kawasaki from the blood film alone. So it comes from a, basically looking at the clinical picture of the child and linking it with the feature seen on the blood film and checking also blood cultures. So that was Kawasaki, and I think I talked to you about that in one of the other um, one of the other workshops. So anybody who wants that case study, let me know. Okay, so we're nearly there. So this case number twenty eight now. We're up to case number twenty eight. This is a female, twenty three, with anemia and bruising. Yeah, they're sure bruising, aren't they? Because the platelet counts eighteen. They're anemic, um, this is okay, but their white cell count is high, 13.5. Uh, 
So I'm a little bit worried about this patient possibly got some sort of, anyway, you can tell me. Um, looking at this or tell yourself because you can't talk to me now. <laughs> These are myeloblasts. They have a high NC ratio, but remember it's not as high as that you see in, that's seen in lymphoblasts. So it's a, and the, and the nucleoli are much more obvious than you see in the lymphoblasts. They're not inconspicuous nucleoli. And then when I look carefully at the cytoplasm, I see an owl rod. So remember, our rods are an accumulation of the primary granules forming a rod-like structure, which are a feature of blasts, myeloblasts, not lymphoblasts, not monoblasts. So if you get a patient like this and you think they've got, well, you can see they've got acute leukemia, um, hunt around, go from field to field and see if you can see any owl rods. And then you can actually report them and let them know instantly that the patient's got acute myeloblastic leukemia. There were 87% blasts on this film with owl rods. And that were there with the markers. Uh, and they had acute myeloid leukemia, not otherwise specified. So acute myeloblastic leukemia without maturation in that WHO classification. So the next case is a male, 45, again with a similar history, anemia and bruising. 95 hemoglobin, plate account 81, and I've flagged the result here. Someone said to me in a workshop, oh, Gillian, I know what this patient is without looking at the blood film because you've given us the D-dimer, which is raised. But let's look at the blood film. So this is promyelocytic leukemia. Actually happens to be the variant, the hypogranular variant. How do I know? Look, there's not that many granules and it's a little bit hard to see from these images. There's few granules here. I can't see from this film if there were our rods. I'm not sure. But they've got the classical bilobing formation of the nucleus, which is classically found in promyelocytic leukemia. So it was there were 17% abnormal promyelocytes. Remember, we don't call these blast cells. They're abnormal promyelocytes. Oh, there was an occasional hour rod prison. Okay. It's the 1517 translocation. Never forget that. You don't have to remember all the cytogenetics and everything, but you mustn't ever forget this. 1517 translocation is a feature of promyelocytic leukemia. And the reason we don't want to call them blast is when we look at the flow, we can see, well, they're myeloid, 13 and 33, but these are the progenitor markers, HLADR and CD34 are both negative. So that's telling you that they're not blasts, they're abnormal promyelocytes. Quote the WHO classification, the latest edition. Okay, I've just told you all of that. Uh, the second last case is a case of a two-year-old just having a routine blood count. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about that. I wouldn't consider that was really iron deficient. I have a ruling that if the MCV and MCH in a two-year-old is um, not less than two units below the normal range, I just say red cells normal for age. Um, so this is pretty close to being uh, seven, well, 69, 70. So I would say normal for age. I'm not too sure what I've given you in the next case, but the plate account was 133. So that's definitely not right for a two-year-old. So this is actually a beautiful film. We can see that the plate account was right, was low. In fact, usually the plate account is usually a bit lower than this, in this particular case. Uh, and I'm going to look carefully. I can see that there are large platelets. 
So what I think of the most two common platelet disorders where we get giant platelets or large platelets is Mayhiglin anomaly and Wiscott Aldridge syndrome. So I can tell easily if it's a Mayhiglin anomaly because I'm going to go onto the slightly thicker part of the film and I'm going to look at the neutrophils. And if it's Mayhiglin, I'm going to see these Durla-like bodies. RNA bodies in the cytoplasm. They're often towards the edge of the cytoplasm. And there we are, they're there. So basically this film is diagnostic of Mayhiglin anomaly. We probably don't have to do any further tests. It's not like, um, she, it's not like the uh, Bernard Soulier anomaly where you have to do platelet function tests and their platelets don't aggregate with ristocetin. So, I've said Durla bodies, they're really sort of Durla-like bodies because the true Durla bodies are found in sepsis, um, but they're referred to as Durla-like bodies. Mayhiglin anomaly. And the last case, the last case, which is a very, not that infrequently occurring, so it's pediatric and I want everybody to be listening really carefully to what I'm saying with this case. There's a little 18 months old baby. They've got a particular rash, um, and, but otherwise they're really healthy. So their platelet count is three. Often the platelet count in this disorder is 10, less than 10. And I've said an otherwise healthy child, everything is all normal. These are all normal for age, completely normal, okay? So when I look at this film, this is what I see. I focus accidentally on a really reactive lymphocyte. Okay, this is very reactive. This is a CD8 positive T cell. So this is telling me that this child has got or had some sort of viral infection. Perhaps that's why the platelet count is so low. So I'm going to go through this film very carefully and I'm going to look to see how many reactive lymphocytes there are. And even if there's just a few, very occasional one, please indicate it in your report. Then I'm going to look for, are there any large platelets? There's none in this film, because this is a case of ITP um, in, this, in this particular image. But if I look around, I might see an occasional large platelet. And if you see large platelets in conjunction with this disorder, ITP, it means that the platelets or well, the bone marrow is trying to respond and produce platelets, but the plate and these large platelets are immature platelets. And so these platelets are being destroyed peripherally in the peripheral blood. So what we've got is red cells normal. We've got reactive lymphocytes present and occasional large platelets seen. And the film is suggestive of ITP. And please put that in because that will save a lot of emotional stress, thinking the child's got a plate to count of three, must have leukemia, not the case. So some doctors will do a bone marrow to show that there are normal numbers of megakaryocytes in the film. Um, and that will pacify the parents of the child. Uh, other, other doctors will say, okay, it's thrombocytopenia, secondary to peripheral platelet destruction. Um, and they'll put the patient on um, intragam, which is IgG, which will gradually make the platelet count come up. So this is immune thrombocytopenic purpura. ITP. Okay. So that is the finish of the last slide. So that's the finish of your case studies. And I think these are very useful case studies to go through and look at and share with the people with whom you work, uh, because it covers a huge number of disorders, red cells, white cells and platelets, and age groups, adults and pediatrics. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy. Um, all these workshops that you've got, you've got some 
really, really good images to look at and a lot of really good education. Please share it with the people with whom you work. That's the end of these case studies. Thank you.